Good morning, Florida. I'm Kathy Barlow. I'm chair of 2020 Women on Boards Florida, and I want to welcome you this morning to our conversation on board diversity, our virtual power breakfast. We're delighted to have you this morning, so thank you for tuning in. Be sure to use the chat and let us know what city you're dialing in from. We'd love to know. So it's my privilege this morning to welcome you on behalf of my co-chairs, Catherine Young, board president of WELL, Nina Gordon, and Sheila Reed. 2020 Women on Boards, for those of you that aren't familiar, is an education and advocacy organization. It's a campaign to achieve gender balance 
on public company boards. 2020 is our 10 year anniversary. This is our victory lap year. We have been working on board diversity since 2010. We've made a lot of progress, but we have more to go. We need your help. So Florida is one of 28 cities that's having this conversation. Um, they've been happening for the past several weeks. We're honored this morning to host our VIP keynote panel containing three successful CEOs and a successful director who sits on multiple boards. They will share their perspective on advancing diversity on, in the boardroom as well as in the C-suite. We have so many people to thank today without whom this event would not be possible. So thank you to our global sponsors. With, without them, the global conversation on board diversity could not happen. Likewise, a special shout out to our Florida sponsors. Many of these sponsors have been with us for multiple years. Thank you, Raymond James, Mosaic, Wellbuilt, City, Ultimate Medical Academy, Ryder, Nelson Mullins, Sykes, my company, Marsh McLennan, Johnson Jackson, Tampa Bay Business and Wealth, South Florida Business and Wealth, and Women in Pension Network. Thank you all so much from the bottom of our hearts. We truly appreciate it. Without your generous support and partnership, this event would not be possible. I also wanna thank our VIP panelists who are sharing their limited time this morning with us, as well as the board director coaches that you will meet later in the program. So we all know that diversity is important, but beyond it being the right thing to do, why is it the smart thing to do? So data shows that women on boards just makes for good business. Companies with diverse boards actually perform financially better. Secondly, companies have customers, uh, employees, and investors, and the greater business community. Each of these should have a role, should have a voice on public company boards. Finally, diversity of thought is important. Diversity in ideas, diversity in viewpoints, it makes for better ideas and decision-making. When everybody looks and sounds alike, there is no room for innovation. These are the topics that we're gonna talk about today. So I was delighted to read two days ago in the Wall Street Journal that NASDAQ, run by a woman, is asking that its 3,000 companies on its exchange actually have to have um, directors that are women, minorities, and LGBT individuals. Very exciting times. So we're really happy to be a part of this movement. So what's our agenda today? First, you'll hear from Betsy berkemer Cordair. Betsy is our global CEO. You will see Betsy's passion and, and you know, endless leadership in this area. Um, and we're so delighted that she could join us today from Los Angeles. So she's dialing in very early and I'm sure she's had a few cups of coffee already. Our second will be the VIP panel. Again, their stories and valuable insights will help you on your board journey. They'll help you accelerate your board journey, hopefully. Finally, the breakout sessions. Each of you will be placed in separate breakout sessions led by experienced director coaches. They will share their experience and wisdom to help you position yourself for board service, either today or at some time in the future. So grab your pen and paper, Make sure you jot down ideas um, for not only today, but for after this program today. So in the past, we've had very successful live events, board readiness workshops, and we're planning on more for next year. So always check our, the website, 2020 Women on Boards, the Florida section, and, and you'll see you know, whatever events that we have going on. On a personal note, I truly hope that you will join our campaign and our host committee here in Florida. It takes a village, uh, as, as the saying goes, and it certainly did today. So I wanna thank the ladies without whom this event would not be possible. I cannot tell you the hours that have been spent on this event literally before COVID started. Um, we meet, we've met weekly, we've had conversations, there's been so much behind the scenes. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts, Ashley Agard, Lee Gray, Megan Lawler, and Mary Key. Thank you, ladies, great job. We also want to thank our host committee, and they helped with our sponsors, Jennifer Ackhart, Kerry Campbell, Aaron Jackson, and Jennifer Jank Suarez. Thanks, ladies. Thanks for bringing us the money. We appreciate it. 
So we're really lucky to have an amazing set of director coaches, and I want to thank them for sharing their time this morning with you. Their thoughts and wisdom clearly will be very beneficial to the group. We're lucky to have such a strong commitment to board diversity in Florida. So thank you all. Now, I would like to introduce Betsy Berkmer Crader. Betsy, as you will see, is an extremely energetic, tireless advocate for board diversity. As I said, she's dialing in early from LA just to be with us in Florida. I've known Betsy since, well, probably three years now. And she's just an amazing individual and, and one that is a true leader. So thank you, Betsy, for joining us. Do you wanna tell us about the numbers, Betsy? So glad to be here. Good morning, Florida. <laughs> yes, indeed. I've had about four cups of coffee and I hope that I'm as energetic as uh, Kathy promised. I'm delighted to be the CEO of 2020 Women on Boards for the last couple of years and uh, working with uh, the team there in Florida with uh, Catherine and Noel uh, has just been a great pleasure. And this is our last day. Uh, interestingly enough, it's our finale of the 28 events that uh, 2020 Women on Boards has put on over the last three weeks. You may have seen our global kickoff, the global broadcast with Melody Hobson and uh, Valerie Jarrett and M Melinda Gates. It was just uh, terrific. Oh, and of course, uh, Martin South from Marsh, uh, thanks to Kathy, was on that uh, global broadcast. And we have since starting 10 years ago with the vision of Stephanie Sonnebend and Mally Giro, our two co-founders, and Stephanie's a, a Floridian, by the way, but with their vision, we started uh, simply to keep track of the numbers of women on corporate boards in, in all of the uh, uh, Russell 3000 companies, and then uh, grew into much greater um, uh, education programs and uh, keeping track of these, these important numbers. So you'll see, our, for the first time, we started back uh, in 2010 when the statistic nationally was only 10% in the Russell 3000, and now it is 22.6% nationwide, and Florida is almost there to our 20% mark. Florida is at 19.7% this year, and that's as high as, you, as, as Florida has been, and you're going to go higher uh, with all the energy and the uh, talent in this room. Let's move on to the next slide. There are 23 out of 25 states that have 20% or more women on their corporate boards. And uh, those new ones, uh, six states uh, just this year joined this elite club, Arizona, Colorado, Indi Indiana, uh, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, and Texas. And soon, of course, next year, Florida will be in this, uh, in this number. So what does it take to get to 20%? Not that much really for Florida companies to get to 20% for all of the Russell 3000 companies, between 68 and 85 more women, all of you in the audience, and we'll make it over the hump. Uh, 68 if, uh, if, if the uh, uh, replacing a man and 85 if the uh, if adding women to the board. So it's a very, or it's the other way around, very, very close to 20%. Our, it's been our target number for 10 years, but it is no longer good enough. So what is good enough? That will be gender balance, because gender balance uh, is what companies, uh, just 5% of the companies in the US and in Florida are currently uh, experiencing and taking advantage of. Uh, but gender balance is what we are focused on now because it's so important to have um, the, the equal uh, influence of men and women, the equal point of view on boards. Currently four companies out of 11, of 111 in, in Florida have gender balance. And next slide, please. Our new campaign therefore advocates and is going to be subtitled Gender Balanced Boards. And that's for all boards, not just corporate, not just the Russell 3000, but those that are hoping to be in the Russell 3000 and private company boards should be gender balanced. Therefore, our vision 
will be that all public company boards at minimum will be gender balanced. That means women holding half of the corporate board seats. So it's a, a huge, huge goal. And our new brand name, Women and Men, is going to be 50-50 women on boards as of January 1st. No longer 2020, obviously that's history, fortunately. But 50-50 women on boards is going to be our name and our mission going forward. Applause, silent applause there. We will continue to educate, collaborate, and advocate for more women on boards and we have new programs coming. You may have known about our highly popular virtual get on board workshops. We have women from around the globe attending and those will start again in February, 2021, right around the corner. You can be on the waiting list on our website and on to something brand new that Stephanie Sonnebend has created, Path to the Boardroom. In fact, uh, Florida and Kathy and Catherine were very uh, influential in helping us decide to do this, where for women in their mid-careers who need greater visibility, who need to understand how to uh, develop their networks early in their careers in order to be qualified and thought of for boards later on, this is what this series of workshops will focus on beginning next quarter. Very exciting. And lastly, certainly we are very active on social media. And I'd like you to stay in touch with us at our website, 2020wb.com, continue to engage with us. And Florida, we're so glad you're with us at 2020 Women on Boards. Thank you. And I'd like to pass the microphone to Catherine Young, uh, the, the statewide president of WELL. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Betsy. And thanks for joining us so early in the morning and for all the amazing work that uh, what will be 50-50 Women on Boards has done and, and our, our uh, partnership over the years. And, and uh, interestingly enough, Wells' vision is also uh, gender parity in, in, uh, in the boardroom. So we, we share your, your mission and, and, and vision and support to advance women in the boardroom and, and C-suite. Well, I'm, th I'm thrilled to um, uh, uh, ask our, our VIP panelists to, uh, to join the stage this morning and uh, begin our, our, um, our panel conversation. Christine, Duffy. I'm here. Good morning. Christine is the president of Carnival Cruise Line. Robert Sanchez, the chairman and CEO of Rider System. Good morning, morning. Robert. Good morning. And Susan Story, the uh, former CEO of American Waterworks and the lead director for Raymond James. Susan just shared this morning that uh, Raymond James in their board meeting yesterday, I believe, appointed a, uh, an additional woman to their board. So they are now at uh, uh, a third 31 percent female representation on their board. So uh, terrific news and, and advancements in the boardroom. You all have been uh, amazing leaders in uh, advancing uh, diversity in the boardroom and, and in the executive suite. And I, I applaud you for your, your passion and your, your passion around uh, uh, gender parity as, as well. Uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Deborah to join us, uh, Deborah Ellinger as our esteemed moderator. Can you see me okay, Catherine? I'm there. Yes, I can. Good morning, Deborah. Good morning. Deborah's been a, 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 a huge advocate as well of uh, gender diversity in the boardroom and, and uh, she is the former um, president CEO of, of four private equity backed uh, companies, Ideal Image, uh, the Princeton Review, Restoration Hardware, and Wellness Pet Food. And she sits on the board of iRobot, Covitrus, and the board of Women Corporate Directors globally. Thanks for joining us, Deborah, and I'll let you uh, take the conversation away. All right, great. Thank you, Catherine, for that kind introduction. And, and good morning, Florida. Believe it or not, I'm actually calling in from an RV in Key West which um, actually tells you how diverse our state is in a lot of different ways. And I can't think of any better way to spend my vacation 
than participating in a, an important discussion like this one. Uh, as Kathleen said, I'm very passionate about this topic and I know our panelists are as well. Um, I think what we'll do, if this is okay, guys, we'll start with talking a little bit about COVID because of the way it has impacted all of our companies. And uh, I'll ask uh, each of you, since you've uh, had to be leaders through these rather challenging times, uh, to give us a little bit of, um, of some background on what you've been dealing with in the last 10 months. Um, Susan, can I start with you? Thank you so much, Deborah. And, um, you know, across the companies on the boards on which I serve, and I retired as CEO of American Water in April of this year, all of the companies um, acted quickly. Some companies acted after everyone was um, doing something and there was a lot of peer pressure. Raymond James, for example, right there in Florida, immediately said, um, you know, from a technology standpoint, it was a big challenge to go from 95% of people working in the office to being at home and they were able to do it with the complex systems of financial services. And safety and security are so important. So there's a difference in companies that are predominantly office and those that have critical frontline employees who have to be out there. And so Dominion Energy is an energy company, Newmont Corporation, is the world's largest gold mining company and I serve on those boards. What I was so impressed with on the safety and security for those companies like Dominion that have people who have to go into customers' homes, it's energy. What they did was they made sure that they had all the PPE they needed. But what I was also impressed about from safety and security, every company wasn't just concerned about their own employees or associates. They were concerned about the communities and the customers. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Dominion Energy had stores of N95 masks and other masks because of some of the work that happens. They figured out how much they needed and then they donated to their communities. They just gave PPE in the early stages of COVID. Newmont Mining not only looked at their employees around the world in countries like Ghana and Suriname, Peru, Argentina, the US, Canada, Australia, but they actually set up a $20 million COVID fund, not internal, but for the communities that they serve to make sure that especially some of the economically distressed would have funds to help them with health care, And they sent out 78 nurses worldwide for their employees so that they wouldn't be a drain on the local healthcare systems. So with COVID, you get to this idea of character of the corporation, which is those corporations that are values-based, that make decisions from what they believe in, like Raymond James does, like Dominion Energy, and like Newmont and my former company, American Water, you know, those decisions for safety and security in the early, mid and late stages of COVID are easy decisions if you are really rooted into values-based and it doesn't become a financial decision. That's a great summary. Uh, Robert, over to you. There probably are some themes here. There are, and I would echo uh, many of the comments that Susan made about, first and foremost, I think it was safety and employee safety. Uh, you know, at Ryder, we, we're, very, we're involved in transportation and logistics. So the vast majority of our employees continued to work through this entire uh, pandemic, which meant making sure that we were providing them all the safety procedures and the equipment to be able to do their jobs and continue to come into work. So we stood up a, a uh, safety supply operation pretty quickly. Uh, had daily calls on any type of infections that we were having across the employee base and, and, and really managing it so that employees could continue to do what they did. And in many cases, what they were doing were delivering essential uh, products to these communities. So a lot of it was food distribution uh, that we're involved in and, and distribution of essential products. So I was very proud. We have 40,000 employees. I think the, the, our team really stepped up and did a phenomenal job uh, on the front line. And we're really excited. We're giving uh, all of our frontline employees a, a bonus now at the end of the year for their, their great contributions during this pandemic. So first and foremost, it was, it was the, the safety and security of the employees. I would say second was the uncertainty created by this pandemic around our own business and understanding how, how are we going to survive and, and are we going to have enough capital? Uh, you know, automotive is a big customer base of ours on our logistics business. All the auto plants in, in the U.S. shut down uh, for about six weeks, which meant, you know, that business was, was not going to be there for, for six weeks. But we hadn't lived through that ever. 
So making sure that we managed our way through that and, and had enough capital, I think a lot of companies really found ways to make sure that they had the capital they needed in order to make it through the pandemic. And then last but not least, I think just helping our own communities. I'm, I'm involved with the United Way here in Miami. This created a lot of pain for many people in, in our communities and making sure that we were involved in, in helping that process and giving back to the communities, I think was the third big piece for us. Okay, uh, over to Christine, because um, I think one could say you've been navigating rough waters during this time uh, as president of Carnival Cruise Line. Can you talk a little bit about that and how it's affected you and your, your rather diverse set of employees? Yes, you know, it's uh, hard to believe that uh, we had to shut down our operation or what we said, put on pause our entire business as we were at sea. Uh, I have uh, a fleet of ships that I'm responsible for, 27 ships, and uh, we, were, we were at sea with guests and uh, nearly 40,000 crew members. And so, of course, safety for our guests, our crew, the ability to bring the ships in, get people home safely, but also the destinations and communities where we bring guests were also impacted. So the logistical challenge of shutting down an operation uh, the size of Carnival Cruise Line and then you know, beyond that Carnival Corporation with over 100,000 employees and a fleet of over 100 ships around the world was a monumental, not only logistics operation, but also in many ways humanitarian. We have crew members uh, that come from over 120 countries and many of those countries were restricting access to their own citizens. We have people from the Mauritius who actually were just able to get home last month, people in uh, Venezuela that we got home two weeks ago. So we've had people on our ships that uh, chose to stay on, which we uh, allowed if they felt unsafe uh, and preferred to stay on board, they were able to do that. And I think the theme you're hearing is that our values and culture, safety and care for our employees uh, and guests was really first and foremost. But I think for us, it is unimaginable that here we are uh, nine months later, we still are not operating. So there is no cruising in the US. Um, it took many months for us to repatriate all of our crew and ultimately because we were not able to use commercial aircraft, we used our ships. Once we realized that we would not be sailing for some period of time, our ships became the transport home for our employees. So it has been an amazing journey. It is continues on, as Robert said. Obviously, uh, we are a $16 billion company uh, in revenue as Carnival Corporation. Uh, to go from that to zero uh, has required a Herculean effort on the part of everybody in the company, our financial teams, the capital that has been raised. And so, as they say, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. And I will say, as we come out of this, uh, we will all be stronger for it. And we will be very excited to put uh, a close on uh, this 2020 year. So yeah, that's, yeah very cool. that's where we are. <laughs> I mean, it's really interesting to think about the challenges that each of your companies have faced and kind of the diversity of the challenge, the fact that there's no playbook for these things. And I would love to see if there's a link between how one handles those challenges and the diversity of both your company and your executive team. And perhaps talk a little bit about, you know, we, we've all read the statistics that say diverse boards drive better results, but I'm wondering if you can make that tangible for us in any particular way. And I'll just open it up, rather than picking on any of you, please just, you know, jump in and let's make this a conversation. I, I will start. Um, oh, go ahead, Christy. I, I was just going to say, Arnold Donald uh, is our CEO for Carnival Corporation, and he's an African American who was on our board for 12 years before being appointed CEO and serves on the board of Bank of America and uh, has just done uh, an incredible job of what he calls engineering diversity into his team. So 
I am the only woman, or was the only woman until uh, earlier this week that was a direct report to Arnold on our corporate leadership team. But I think, you know, we all have a role to play and different skills uh, and how we lean in. And I would say for me, I, I am very much, uh, you know, the, the person who feels for our people in a way that has driven, I'll say a shift in the level of communication and focus on communicating, especially during a crisis. Even when we don't have anything new to say, I typically was the voice that said, it doesn't matter. We are dealing with this every minute of every day, but for people around the world, even when we don't have something specific and tangible, that that need for people to stay connected, especially as everyone has shifted to this virtual environment has been so important. So I think for each of us on our leadership team at Carnival, people have really leaned into their experience and skills and brought that voice, um, which Arnold has created with the, a very diverse uh, global team. And uh, we've really, I think that's helped us um, greatly in the crisis. Terrific. Susan, did you want to add to that? Christine brings up a good point, and I think we would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge that in addition to the pandemic this year, we also faced a lot of issues around systemic racism with what happened with George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor. So I want to take those two together because it's not just a pandemic issue. What I found so incredible about the three companies I'm on, and I'll give you some specific examples. I think in all of the companies, there are more honest conversations going on about race. Um, people speak up that haven't spoken up before. And I'll give you an example. At, at Raymond James in our San Francisco office, we had a person who was not the target of a video, but had a relationship with someone who did something that really went viral that was considered to be racist. Um, you know, the Raymond James management said, although this person didn't do it, we have to take a stand. And the person was talked to and is no longer with the company. And that sent big, a big message throughout the company. I'll also mention that Dominion Energy, where I am, the general counsel is African-American. They have three officers. And I had long conversations with them. And what really meant a lot was one of the, the general counsel, who's African-American, said, you know, Susan said, I was given a chance because our CEO believes that we're better if we reflect our customer base. And he gave me a chance and this, this person is doing an incredible job. And also Dominion Energy decided, you know, not only did they put up $35 million for historically black colleges and universities, but in, to decide how to spend that money among the universities and colleges in the states they serve, they have a group of employees who are people of color at all levels who are making those decisions, not the top management. Um, things like that, I will tell you that it comes from an appreciation, but it also comes from those of us who are on boards where it, there's, there's a lot to this three women is key to, as a start. And we have these open conversations. Raymond James Board, we have had these open conversations since all of this started with what can we do? Paul Riley, the CEO and chairman said, the company is making a commitment to our black associates. And the board said, we want to sign on too. So we all signed the pledge, including the board as a promise of what our commitment was. So this idea of diversity shouldn't be new anymore. It should be, what are we doing to really make this widespread? The last thing I'll say, and I'll be quiet, the most powerful message I heard during all of the discussion around the social justice I read this and I thought it was very powerful. A person said, it's not enough to say, I don't abuse my children. You have to do something to stop it. It's not enough to say, I'm not racist. You have to do something to stop it. I think that's a very powerful statement. And uh, you know, part of this, and, and Robert, perhaps you want to add a few comments. I just want to remind folks in the audience, please uh, feel free to send questions in the chat or comments, or you know, if anything resonates, um, let's get the chat going and get your, your thoughts as we move along. 
Robert, what did you want to add? Yeah, I would I would just add that as uh, at Ryder, as, as we got the, as the pandemic hit, I think a lot of us, and, and it's interesting because on my leadership team, we've got a lot of finance people um, who immediately jump into the numbers on, all right, how are we going to survive? How do we make sure we got money going to the bottom line? Uh, we have a great chief marketing officer, our company, her name is Karen Jones. And, and I would say Karen during this time really did a phenomenal job of keeping us looking to the future, that we're going to get past this. And especially when it came to continuing to invest in product development and those type of things, which she leads. Um, you know, our, our initial reaction for many of us was, hey, we got to cut all costs and we just got to wait until, you know, this storm passes and really helping us kind of continue to look out beyond the crisis, I think I, I would say has been the, the, the biggest contribution uh, that she's made during this time. And, and then on our board to, to echo some of Susan's comments around the George Floyd issue, we have two African-American board members at Ryder. And I got to tell you when this uh, issue happened, obviously we were all affected by that video, but in one of our board meetings, uh, the, the two board members really shared their personal experiences uh, uh, as African-Americans. It's gonna be something that you don't always talk about. And that really kind of, uh, you know, brought to the surface, you know, something that even as a CEO of a company where 20% of our employees are, are African-American, I never thought about it, and 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 it was it wasn't just about the video. It was the feeling of highly successful, you know, outstanding uh, African Americans who still feel like they weren't treated the same way. And how do we change that? So we've kicked off numerous uh, initiatives to help that also. Yeah, yeah, I've personally experienced that as well. It, you only really understand it when people you know can share with you their experiences. So, you know, we've all talked about diversity on boards and our executive teams. I think it'd be helpful to talk a little bit about how you get there. And maybe we could just transition. If you could each tell us something about your boards and how you sort of went about increasing diversity on your boards. I know, Robert, you've said in the past, you got to start somewhere, start with one. So maybe we could start with you, if that'd be okay. Sure, I, and I think that's the story at Ryder. I, I've been very fortunate. I've been at Ryder for, for 27 years. and and diversity at Ryder, we're, we're a trucking company. We have a lot of truck drivers, we have a lot of, of mechanics, not typically the most diverse industry in the world. But a CEO back in the 90s, uh, Tony Burns, really kicked off this initiative to become more diverse at the board level and introduced you know, the first woman on our board, the first African-American on our board in the early 90s. So I would say before it was really in to be diverse. And that really created an environment where uh, the first uh, woman board member at Ryder introduced a second board member, woman board member at Ryder, then a third. And that's how we started really building up uh, diversity, uh, first at the board level, then ultimately within the company. But it, it really, you know, it, it, I know we want to start with three, but sometimes it, many companies just get one first and then one will help you get the second and the third. And then you start to really build that out. You know, I'll, I'll talk about a personal experience. So when I was I was CEO of American Water for six years, we actually did get gender parity. Um, in fact, um, it was funny that um, at one point, two of our male board members retired and we were 63% women. We're an S&P 500 company and everyone got this letter from BlackRock Larry Fink. And I remember I responded back to him and said, we are so committed to gender parity that we're actively recruiting males for our board, <laughs> which most S and P 500 companies don't say that, but we were at 50. We were 63. We recruited two men. We were 50 percent. Um, and and I tell you the secret. And Robert is exactly right. The secret is that I found it's easier to keep gender parity once you get there because so much of board recruitment in the U.S. It's not this way globally. Almost two thirds are from networking, not from recruiters, and a little over a third are from recruiters. So it's who is around the table. When you have women around the table and people of color around the table, they know more people like them, they bring them to the table and it's an easy kind of thing to go, wow, this is a great person. Many times it's just, they, they aren't exposed and don't know, the directors don't know. So, I, you know, for me at American Water, and it was great when I left, my successor is a male, but when I left the chairman of the board, which is a split position, he's, he's a male, he said, I commit to you that we're going to keep this gender parity on this board after you're gone. And, and that was very powerful. I'm on another board, Newmont Corporation, that has gender parity. And um, they're of the independents, five are women, five are men, 
and um, the CEO is a, is a man. And they actively, this is just a priority for the board. And it's not one of those things that gets debated. It's like, well, we've got to have this representation so we can represent our employees and we can represent our communities. And, and you mentioned Raymond James this week, we just elected the fourth woman on the board and we are almost a third of women on the board. And I remember going on the board 13 years ago, there were two of us. And um, so, the big thing is we have to be on there and we have to broaden the pool of people who we attract. And you know what? I never want to hear, well, well, we, let's make sure women and people of color are qualified. It goes without saying that's a baseline. Just bring good people. And by the way, they happen to be women or people of color or not. I think that's very well said, Christine. You know, I would add, I think there's really been a shift. So I joined earlier this year uh, the board of Ambridge Hospitality, which is private equity backed. And in the discussions I had with the chairman and, and the PE uh, team as part of that process, um, they were very focused on, you know, we would like you to join the board. And then, you know, my point was, that's great, but then what happens next? And they were and are very committed and to Susan's point, uh, you know, looking to me and, and I'm happy to play the role of, hey, we need to get some more women on this board with me. And uh, the opportunity for, for me in this case to be able to recommend and introduce other women, I think is what shifted. Even if it's, even if you're the first one, the ability to bring on more, I'm on another board with Hershen Entertainment, which is a private three generation family company. And uh, they, at, they had one woman on the board. Um, they had no people of color or minority. So when they went through their board search process, they, there were actually two, uh, two women and they had only planned to bring on one new board member. And in discussions with each of us, not knowing each other individually, we both said to them, well, why don't you bring us both on? Why, why not two? And actually they brought both of us on. And now, as we just talked about this year with what's happening, this is a company that has said, my goodness, we need to have more diversity on our board. We need to bring mine on to reflect our customers and to reflect our values. So now that focus is happening. And so I, I really do feel more than ever before um, what comes out of crisis often leads to better things. And I think while we've been focused and talking about gender parity and women, I think that same, it, the lens is wider now where it's not only gender, but it truly is diversity of thinking and backgrounds, including minorities, women of color who have been completely underrepresented. So I think it's an exciting time. And I think we each have an opportunity for those of us that are on boards or maybe just that single one woman, as, as Susan said, that it's our opportunity to, to use our networks and, and include and add more women. So I think that's very well said, and obviously the four of us are proponents of diverse boards, but you know there are still quite a lot of companies that are not quite there yet. And I'm curious what you guys think about various efforts to legislate this or to sort of encourage it in some what some might call heavy handed ways. I mean, just recently we had NASDAQ's new initiative uh, announced that they would like to see their boards have women and diverse members. I'm just curious what each of you think about you know, legislation or mandates as a way to get there? I'm actually against quotas. Um, I'm for targets. And the reason is that, first of all, I do think things like NASDAQ, most shareholders, if you're a publicly traded company today, the largest passive holders that are the index fund kind of holders, the, the Black Rocks, the Vanguards, there's requirements there. But, but, you know, there's a more important thing, and I want to mention this, is that there is study after study that shows that if you have a diverse board and a diverse C-suite and diverse employees, that your financials are better. And I'll give you a real life example. So at American Water, when I retired there, we were in the Bloomberg Gender Equality Index, the NAACP's Inaugural Equity and Inclusion Index, the Disability Index with 100% perfect score, best for vets, we were named by S&P Global this year as the number one U.S. company on ESG 
and number two globally. So we got environmental and all that stuff. Well, what about financials? In the six years I was there, our stock price and market cap tripled. And through the end of last year, our total shareholder return was 231% compared to the S&P 500 of 97%. And our dividend grew at over 10% a year on average. So, you know, people that say you have to choose between financial performance versus be doing the right thing, they don't understand. This isn't about a quota so that you can check a box that I have a woman or I have a person of color. This is a business imperative. And we need to think about it as a smart business decision because, and, and I'll let Christine make her points because I know she feels strongly about what happens if you have a quota and you happen to be one of those folks. Thanks, Susan. I, I, I do agree. I don't think quotas are the answer. And I, I think that in some ways the quota diminishes the reality that there are many, many qualified people, women, minorities that are ready to serve. And you have to be committed. I think it goes back to what are the values of the company. And before we can get on boards, we have to be given the opportunity to serve in roles inside of corporate America where that sets us up with the experience, skills that we need to actually be ready to serve on a board. Um, this focus of the conversation is about women on boards, but we've got to start to ensure that we're, we're bringing women through organizations, development, so that they are board ready. And I know we have a number of people in the audience um, that are at that point. I think we've also got to make sure if we're going to reach gender parity on boards, we've got a lot more work to do inside of companies to ensure that women women of color, minorities, real diversity, as my CEO Arnold says, that we are engineering this into the way we operate because not only is it the right thing to do, as you so eloquently said, and not only said, but frankly, Susan, have delivered as a CEO, it drives the results. So there really shouldn't be much of a debate here. We're on a track. We need to hurry up and make sure that we continue to make this happen. But I, I want to just reinforce, it's got to happen inside of the company so that we really are bringing people through. Yeah, and Deborah, I would only add that as a, as a, as a Hispanic CEO and board member, which is also a group that's very underrepresented in the boardrooms and even in the C-suites, I, I am against quotas also in legislature. And as a CEO, I guess I'm a I guess against all regulation, but certainly uh, plowing on more regulation and more legislation uh, for something that to me is a competitive advantage, which is diversity, I, I think is a wrong idea. Let those companies that don't want diversity, let them go out of business over time and let the companies that are pushing for diversity continue to win. And we're gonna win with what we're doing. You look at the progress that's been made with women on boards in the last five years, getting to parity in the next five years, in the next five to six years is, is not out of the question. There's a lot of highly qualified women coming up. I don't think it has to be legislated. I think companies are aware of this, um, you know, competitive advantage you can get by having women on boards and having women in your C-suite. And we're, they're going to go after it. They're going to go after it. And the ones that don't aren't going to succeed. So I think that's a much better approach than, than, than putting in quotas and, and also making it that you get people to check the boxes, which leads to very bad unintended consequences. So I think the, the way to do it is allow the, the market to keep working. Yeah. yeah I mean, I can add one more thing, Deborah. And I think what Robert and Christine said is so important. What I would hate to see is for someone to do something because they have to. Because let me tell you, if you're the first woman or the first person of color on the board or in the C-suite, but they're only doing it because they have to, your odds of really making a difference and changing things is a little bit diminished. And so this is very, very, a really important discussion. And there are great ideas on all sides and I respect all of those, so. Yeah, well, I was just gonna, you know, I, I think we're all, there may be some commonality in the view here, but I would also say just to be provocative for a minute that, you know, we certainly saw that California increased its diversity after they had uh, 
and I'm just looking at the chat, you know, Stephanie has the statistics there, also that the US is somewhat behind you know, some, some other countries that have done better without it all falling apart. And they've had uh, reg regulation or legislation to get there. So to me, it's not a, a simple answer. Um, so with that, perhaps we can talk a little bit then about how do you find diverse candidates for your boards? And, and maybe you can talk about just the practicality of it, because I think many of the audience members might be interested to know how they can get on a board. And a good place to start with that is how have your boards found candidates? How do you use your networks? Do you go to recruiters? If you could each just talk a little bit about how you've done it, that would be really helpful. I would like to just um, comment on, I saw the chat from Lee, um, because I, 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 I'm focused, obviously, you know, my career has been in on primarily on the corporate side. I did run a trade association um, in Washington, which is actually what led me to Carnival. So sometimes, as we talk about, you might need to take a step out or a lateral, or in my case, frankly, a step back out of corporate. Getting myself into the trade association um, really shifted my background and experience. And when Carnival Cruise Line had gone through some major um, crisis uh, at the corporate level, and I was serving in that role as CEO, um, that, that is actually what led me to this role. I'm a unique, um, you know, I did not have a corporate background uh, for, this is my first public company job. And Lee also makes the point, and I think we should reinforce, there's also, I think, a greater opportunity today than ever before for people who have, are in public service. So in my case, it happened to be a trade association, but you look at people in government, and I know on our own board, um, we have the retired head of the uh, British Royal Navy who is on our board. Obviously, we're in um, the maritime industry. So I think there's also a bigger opportunity today in many ways for people with very specific um, public service, technical compliance. As we look at ESG, uh, those skills and experiences are now becoming more and more important. So I think the, the set of experience and backgrounds that boards require today as we operate in a very different environment with technology and as I said, ESG is also opening up an opportunity where I think in the past, a lot of the board seats were filled with people that had financial backgrounds. Um, so I, I think that is a, a point worth uh, talking about. Maybe Robert, you could talk about this because I know you've got a strong point of view about some of the needs, the skills that are needed. Yeah, I think, look, when you when we're looking for board members on the boards that we're on, obviously the first thing we ask for is anybody on the board knows somebody. So this networking is very important and, and getting to know people who are on board certainly helps. But I would tell you that's the first step. You don't usually, you don't always find somebody there. Usually you go to a recruiting firm. And I think getting your name to the recruiters so they know who you are, they know you're out there, they know your capabilities, I think is a very important step because uh, once you're on that list, that's who brings the, the candidates forward to, to companies. And what do we look for? I'll, I'll give you the easy answers, right? We look for sitting CEOs. Everybody wants a sitting CEO, a sitting CFO, retired, people with financial backgrounds, as Christine mentioned, uh, folks that have worked at the audit firms uh, are always, you know, the easy picks because they're the ones that can come into a board and you always, you need financial experts on every board. And the other piece that I think is really important is we're always looking for people that understand what it means to be a board member. It is not to run the company. It is not to be part of the management team, which if you haven't done it before, it is a very different uh, position to be in. So I think another thing I would certainly recommend everybody just learn about being a board member. Your, your, your role is primarily an oversight role. Uh, it is really evaluating the CEO uh, and making decisions on that. But the, the desire to want to get in and run the company yourself not good. Most most management teams aren't looking for board members that want to do that. They want it. They want board members that understand the role. So I think that's an important piece to being ready is is making sure you understand the role. And first of all, I agree with everything Christine and Robert have said. I think those are great summaries. I want to put this into two pieces. 
One is what does the board look for? And then talk about given how the board looks for diverse candidates, what does that mean in terms of people who wanna be on boards? And I agree with everything Robert said. The first thing is you look around the table, do we know someone who would be good? Then a recruiting firm. And, and I wanna use Raymond James as an example because they've done a great job of this. The first thing is, do you know someone have also used recruiting firms, although only a little over a third of companies do. But another thing is I was a founding CEO of the New York Stock Exchange Board Advisory Council. Betty Lou is vice chairman of New York Stock Exchange. She wanted a way for more women and people of color to be exposed to New York Stock Exchange companies for their boards. So a year and a half ago, we actually started a database. It currently has about 200 women and people of color and each New York Stock Exchange company recommended someone. It's a fabulous database that if you're looking for someone in financial services, transportation, logistics, you name it, you can go through that database. As a member of the New York Stock Exchange, and because I knew about that, the problem is not many people realize that it's there if you're listed on the stock exchange, is I brought that to Raymond, to Raymond James and we started looking through there. And then a fourth thing is I learned through another board member of mine, this is where the networking comes in, that there's a gentleman, Tracy Porter, who's African-American, and he has started a database of board ready African-Americans. And so there's, use your own kind of electronic Rolodex, that goes way back, most of the people under 40 have no idea what that means. Um, the second thing is recruiters, which are great and they can do a lot, but also there are a lot of organizations out there who can do this pre-work for you if we get wider spread so that boards know I can get that New York Stock Exchange um, and it's some amazing people on it, by the way, all women are people of color, or I can go to things like Tracy Porter's done. So in terms of how boards do it, those are some of the resources. Again, agreeing with everything Christine and Robert said, to get yourself ready, so one of the big questions that comes up is, if I'm on a nonprofit board, does that qualify me to go on a private or publicly traded company board? It doesn't, but, but, big but, but being associated with professional associations and nonprofits that others who are on boards or are executives at companies, and they look at you and how you operate. And I'll give you a real world example. I joined Raymond James 13 years ago. I was on the Florida Council 100 as CEO of Gulf Power with Tom James. And I actually followed Tom as the chair of the Florida Council 100, the first woman in their 50 year history. Tom calls me up and says, I like the way you think. I've worked with you on some policy issues. I'd like for you to interview with our board. So I think board service on professional organizations, on nonprofits is great for the networking, but then demonstrating skills that are financial, technology, client related, marketing, all of those things also gives you a leg up if you're not in the C-suite of your company. Okay, we have just a few minutes left. Um, I would like to just quickly go a little further on this question of whether nonprofit boards help and then ask you each if you could wrap up with, you know, one piece of advice for our audience. So on the nonprofit one, I get asked that a lot and, and some folks would say, only join a nonprofit if either you're passionate about the topic or it's got the connections. And Susan, you talked about the connections. Um, I, I would love to know, Robert and Christine, you know, your view on like local nonprofits. Is that helpful or not? And whether you recommend folks should do that or not. I can speak to my experience. And again, it actually ties back to how I got into the position that I'm in. I've only been at Carnival for five years. What got me to the trade association, uh, which was running the global association for the cruise industry, was work uh, that I had done through the U.S. Travel Association. And U.S. Travel, back in 2008, with the financial crisis, I found myself, my business was greatly impacted. I engaged with U.S. Travel, other industry leaders, went to DC and we began lobbying. We've created a public private corporation to market the US. And through that experience, I got on the radar when uh, the cruise industry was searching for the new CEO of CLIA. So very specifically, had I not engaged with my industry association and network, I wouldn't have gotten to CLIA 
I wouldn't be a carnival. I wouldn't yeah. be on two boards I, today. So. I think an industry association is a little different and it's a national one in your case. And I, I you know, I think there is a difference between being on a non local nonprofit where your job is to raise money, you know, mm -hmm. versus really being on an organization with, uh, you know, an audit committee, a compensation committee and all of those things that you have to do on a public board. So Robert, I'll give you yeah, a chance to, to comment I, as well. I would agree with that. I think it, you know it, the, the the nonprofit board is really a networking. I, I hate to put it that way. It's a networking opportunity. It's where you're going to meet other yeah. folks who may be on public boards that then can see you function. Okay, so that that's one way to do it. The other thing is to get exposure to your own board. If you're in a company, a public company that has a board, finding ways to make sure they get to know who you are because those are the people that are going to recommend you or be. Or, or there, that other boards are going to go to when they're looking to find out if you're if you would be a, a qualified board member. So, getting exposure, whether it's through your own board or through some type of non for profit board, where you have members on that board who are part of a, of a public company board, I think would be the way to do it. Okay, um, just looking at the chat, there've been some questions about how do you get on the NYSC board database and such. I would ask if uh, if someone from Women on Boards can make sure that we come back to our audience with you know any key takeaways or responses on those. And it sounds like uh, 2020 Women on Boards will be working on that topic anyway. And so with that, I would like to just give each of you a chance to say what's your one piece of advice for people who'd like to get on boards. And uh, Susan, why don't you lead off? When, when you're trying to get on a board, sometimes it's all about how can I get a company to come to me? The one piece of advice I would give you is this. First of all, the time commitment for a publicly traded company or a private company is quite extensive. It's not the same as you show up for the meetings. There, is, there are tens, tw dozens of hours that are required of prep time, the fiduciary responsibility. So, so make sure you understand that. But the piece of advice I would give you this it's not anything technical. Make sure if you join a board that their values basically are synergistic with yours. If you're, if the company you're going into does not have the same values, for me, it's safety and the focus on safety for employees and customers and communities. And the second thing is integrity, honesty, and transparency. And the fact of the matter is there are worse things than not being on a board and it's being on a board that you don't agree with what they do, how they do it, and you may can change it, but I've got to tell you, every board I'm on, I only went on after careful look at how they treat their employees, how they are perceived in the marketplace by their customers or clients, and how they give back to their communities. Make sure or you will be miserable. I think that's great advice. Let's do Robert and then Christine. I think there's three things. First and foremost, be qualified, right? So everybody on this call already is, you know, make sure you're doing a great job at, at what you do and that you're in a position to be attracted uh, by a board. Get your name in front of the recruiters would be the second thing. So the recruiting firms know who you are and they they, they have you in their database or Rolodex as, as, uh, as Susan said. And then the third thing is be selective. Don't jump on the first board opportunity if it's not the right one for you. It's a little bit like Hotel California. It's, it's, it's great to check in, but you can't check out. It's hard to get off of a board. So making sure you pick the right one, as, as Susan said, that, that is, is consistent with your own values and the way, the way you want to operate is extremely important. Being on a bad board could be a very consuming uh, issue. So make sure you pick the right ones. Great advice. Christine, you get to wrap us up. Well, as I said, I think um, being involved in your industry and creating and establishing a network, not just where you're trying to put yourself out there, but also where you're focused on engaging with people from outside your company, uh, especially for people who are not a sitting CFO or CEO or somebody that's perceived in the suite. How can you really distinguish yourself? And, and actually in the way you would approach selling, you know, are there certain companies to Susan's point for me, it is all about, you know, there is a collegial atmosphere being on a board, you are part then of that company and their culture and making sure that there's great alignment. So do your homework. There's nothing that says, hey, in the long run, 
Um, these are the kinds of companies that I would aspire to be on a board and really do the work to figure out how do you make the steps to figure out who do I need to get to know? Who's the recruiting firm that this company works for? I think there's a lot more you can do tangibly um, to position yourself, not only to get on the board, which I think we've talked about here, but then specifically, what company do you have a lot of energy and passion and interest where then you also believe you can bring something to them? And how do you make that known? So that's, proactive. that's wonderful, wonderful advice to wrap us up. Uh, and with that, I want to say thank you to, to our wonderful panelists. That was excellent. And I'm going to turn over to Catherine to uh, take us to the next session. Thank you, Deborah. This was an amazing conversation. And I, I really uh, applaud all of you for your transparency, uh, your, your inspiration, your advice, and, and your leadership. Uh, it, it takes leaders like you to, uh, to move the needle and to, to stand up for what's right. And, and your, your integrity is, is uh, uh, admirable and, and, uh, and applauded. So thank you for, for your leadership. And um, with that, I will um, um, pass it back to, to Kathy Barlow to, uh, to wrap up this part of the, the program. Thanks, Catherine. Great, great panel. I thought it, there were amazing nuggets. I literally have a ton of notes. So I hope everybody in the audience has them as well. I mean, it, it's invaluable, in my opinion. Um, so after chairing this event for a few years now, I've witnessed firsthand the growth and awareness of how critical board diversity is and the actions boards are taking. I mean, obviously, Collectively, we're making a difference, but making a difference doesn't happen all on its own. Uh, it takes a small army of volunteers uh, and sponsors to bring this opportunity to you. So again, I just wanna thank our amazing sponsors that we've had this year. It's been a challenging year uh, with COVID, so their support is, you know, is truly more important than ever. Um, we've had the most impressive companies that were eager to support us and be part of this Florida conversation. I also want to thank the ladies that, you know, stepped up to be the muscle. Uh, Nina Gordon, Sheila Reed, Megan Lawler, Ashley Agard, um, Lee Gray, Mary Key. I mean, you all, you ladies are amazing. We all, we all gelled as a team and, you know, brought together this event. So, so without you, couldn't have been done. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, and, and finally, audience, if you like what you've heard today, please consider being a part of the ongoing host or leadership committee of 2020 Florida on boards. I mean, look, we, you know, we have to make changes. I know there were some comments in the chat, like, why is Florida behind? Well, be part of the solution. Like, let's not talk about the problem. Let's find a way to be part of the solution, to encourage boards, you know, look at our website, um, email us, uh, you know, you, you have all the information for, you know, the leadership committee, send me an email, link on, in, in with us on LinkedIn. I mean, get involved. We, we, there are, you know, roles for everybody. So hopefully you'll do that. So now it's time to transition to the second part of the program. I hope that everybody stays on. This is really critical. We have amazing director coaches that are just waiting to give further insights. So I'm going to turn it over to Ashley for her to tell us how we're going to do it. Ashley. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks, panelists. What a great panel. Um, we are really excited about our breakouts. And I've been doing a lot of work behind the scenes to make sure each one of you has a great experience. You know, our goal with the breakouts has been to create an intimate sort of small group discussion. And I can just tell by the chat firing up that there's a lot in this group to talk about. So we think you're really going to find the breakouts um, both enlightening and really engaging. One of the things we tried to do this year was to recognize that all of us are on a different point on our board service journey. Some of you may already be on boards looking to expand, looking to change. Others may be just a few years, you, you've got it, you're ready and you're ready to get out there. And then I know there's folks on this call too that are just sort of starting to think about the board service. Regardless of where you are in your journey, this is really your chance during the breakouts to engage, to get your questions answered and to really get some great insight and advice from just a wonderful group of highly experienced board directors. So ladies and gentlemen, what's next? Just like if you're at a conference, you're gonna to head to your breakout room here in just a minute. 
our director coaches are already en route to the rooms. And I can tell you from my email lighting up light, late last night and this morning, they're really looking forward to seeing all of you at your breakout. It's really easy to go to your breakout room. All you've got to do is leave this webinar and you're going to log in to your second link in your calendar invite that should, it's marked, it says, here's your breakout room. Click on that and you're gonna just enter, nothing else you need to do. Now, I know some of you may have just grabbed the email that came in first thing this morning that had this panel on it. So know that the, your breakout link is gonna be in the email you received earlier, the invite. So just go pop into your invite um, and it should be clear there. If you have any problem, you can't find it, no worries whatsoever, popped in the chat here is our help desk. Feel free to go straight to the help desk. We've got a great team behind the scenes here that are working with us and they'll help you get to the right place. So hopefully that's clear. Is everybody ready? What we're gonna do now is take a stretch, grab another cup of coffee, and we'll see you in just a couple of minutes in your breakouts.